All right. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for joining us for another webinar presented by the Zygo Corporation. My name is Eddie Lavilla, and I'm with the Zygo Applications team. And I do have with me here Richard Poltar, who's also part of the Zygo Applications team. And today we're going to be looking at from model to measurement, working with MX data inside of opti optical design software. So a couple of quick points before we actually get started. In case you guys haven't um, actually attended one of our webinars before, or you haven't used GoToWebinar, this is just a quick slide to show you some of the different um, functionality of GoToWebinar. Uh, you can collapse down my face if you go ahead and so choose. We're going to be mostly working on the presentation and the different software packages going back and forth between them. Um, you can also dock the panel um, or take a look at the different uh, question sections if you'd like to submit a user question. Rich will be monitoring those. And then there's also a handout attached to the webinar, um, which you can also find on this uh, panel on the right here. So we'll go ahead and just give you a few seconds to familiarize yourself, and then we'll go ahead and launch straight into the webinar. All right. So as I mentioned, there is going to be a handout to this presentation. And so uh, if you want to go ahead and review this later, uh, feel free to do so. There's going to be some acronyms in there. So there's just a glossary of terms that are presented up front. Uh, I do expect this webinar to take about 40 minutes with questions. Um, and it might feel like it's quite fast and, and quite quick. But we're really just trying to inspire you to understand that you can actually perform this kind of uh, uh, data manipulation and data exchange between um, MX and optical software. So that's real motivation for this thing here. And so as I just mentioned, the uh, things that we're going to be covering in the webinar is going to be this exchange of data between MX, and in this case, it's going to be ZMAX Optic Studio. And we want to look at how we exchange data between the, con the conversion of surface and wavefront data that comes out of our uh, interferometers and how we can convert that to phase or surface information inside of our optics package. Um, and we'll show two test cases of that. We'll go through the mechanics of what that actually looks like. And then we've got a real-world example where we design and spec a um, beam reducer assembly, we built that assembly, and then we'll take a look at the measurement and the modeled wavefront data after that. So the motivation behind this webinar is really uh, kind of the motivation of what we think about when you think of an optical system or creating an optical system. And there's three major areas that actually uh, go into this design and creation of this optical system, one being design, and then we have fabrication and metrology. And there's double arrows here specifically because as we move from conception to prototype to eventually production, oftentimes there's information exchange between these different areas that really lends to the end performance or the end goals of the design and such that we want to look at the interplay between some of these different areas. And for this webinar in specific, we're going to look at the interplay between design and then metrology. And what we're trying to do here is learn something about our optical system, whether this is early in the process or late in the process, we can try to understand some new information. And this might be something like, how do my mechanical mounting um, you know, features per affect performance, for instance? Uh, how do fabrication errors affect end performance? Uh, can we predict something about the alignment errors and then actually subtract those alignment errors out when I go to do my metrology? Or even, how hard is my metrology set up uh, going to be given my test surface or the method that I'm trying to apply. So we really want to see how we can exchange information between these two software packages and does that tell us new information about our optical system. And so to do that, we're going to start out in MX software. And this is a Zygo built software package, uh, proprietary to Zygo, that both acquires data and allows you to do advanced analysis. And that the way we've tried to create optics, or excuse me, MX, is for easy use of both data exchange and then, like I said, analysis. So you can do things like interact with a surface or wavefront map in many different forms on plots. You can perform advanced analysis. You can look at specialized toolboxes. You can look at statistics based on your measurement. There's a lot of flexibility here um, to both understand your data set inside of MX, and then as we're going to see in this webinar, getting this data out to actually go interface with other uh, software packages and that secondary software package, as I mentioned, is going to be Optic Studio from ZMAX. Now, the techniques that I work with um, in this webinar can be applied to any commercial optical modeling software package. Uh, it just so happens that Optic Studio is the one that I'm the most familiar with. So that's really where uh, we're going to focus um, on some of these steps. So to start, we're going to have those two case studies. And this is going to be getting information from MX, whether this is surface or wavefront data, and then how we import that into Optic Studio. 
So we're going to start looking how we work through the mechanics of this process of moving the data over and then actually applying it properly to Optic Studio. And so I wanted to just give the workflow uh, of this kind of process here. And so what we're gonna do for this case one is assume that we have an F1 lens system that we've measured in transmission. And you'll see the little cartoon under here uh, that would give you a mock-up of how this might be set up with our interferometer. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that measured data and export that as a Zernike INT file or an interferometer file, which is going to capture basically the Zernike coefficients representing our wavefront in this case. And so when we export that from MX, we're going to then uh, convert this over into the .dat native file format to Optic Studio. And then we're going to apply this error at the exit pupil of our test system. And so we're going to be working with the paraxial equivalent of our F1 lens system inside of ZMAX. And then once we do this, we're going to go ahead and review uh, the wavefront error that's associated with this measurement. And so really what we're doing here is we're taking our lens assembly, collapsing it down to a paraxial equivalent, and then introducing the phase error that we've actually measured using our interferometer. And what our goal is at the end of this is we want to actually now compare the two wavefronts between Optic Studio and the one that we get out from MX. So this is kind of our ending landing point. And this is just going to make sure that we've applied the mechanics and these steps correctly of getting data from MX over to Optic Studio. So with that, we will navigate to MX first. And you'll notice that I have an F1 lens data assembly uh, data set put up here on the screen. And so this is already loaded into MX. And so our first job is going to be exporting uh, this file into that INT Zernike format. And there are a few different ways to do that. You could go to surface processing and export from there. There's a user tools function that allows you to export from there. But I'm mostly going to use this Zernike toolbox, one of our specialized toolboxes that are standard to MX. Um, we're going to go ahead and open up the Zernike's toolbox. And you're looking at um, MX 8.0 at this point in time. It's our newest release that we've just come out with. And so inside of our toolbox here, We've turned on the Zernike fit. We've given it a 12th order fit over here. And now we have a representation of our surface wavefront, or excuse me, the wavefront error um, in Zernike coefficients. And we could either right click and do an export of this table, or there's a very convenient button underneath the controls panel to do this export. You will be prompted for uh, potentially some commentary. This is going to go into the INT data file. It's not required to do, but if you want to add some notes in there, uh, you can do so, but I'm going to go ahead and skip that. And then we're going to save it as an INT file. I have a name for it here already, and we're just going to simply say save. So now our measured wavefront is captured in this INT file. So with this, we can navigate over to Optic Studio. And you'll see I have a model already set up here. So we're going to talk about a few things before we actually do the conversion from MX into Optic Studio. And if we have a true F1 lens assembly, you can imagine in my lens data editor that I would have multiple elements. So several surfaces, several lens elements making up my F1 lens assembly. And with this, right, we want to collapse that system down to a paraxial equivalent. So it's effectively going to turn this into a black box for us. And so before we do that, it's important to understand two key parameters of our optical system before we actually do this transform. So if we go to analyze at the top and we locate the report section, there's going to be this prescription data um, window that we can bring up and that's hiding back here. And those two parameters that I mentioned are going to be the exit pupil diameter and then the exit pupil position. And so when we're creating our paraxial equivalent, we're going to track these two values to a properly apply the same setup in our now paraxial equivalent. And so You'll notice I have these two lens surfaces hidden here. So let's go ahead and hide our paraxial equivalent, undo these two, and then apply our surface stop back to the paraxial lens. So we've taken effectively an F1 lens assembly. And the reason I don't have that populated in um, the lens data editor is that data file is a sample data set from uh, Zygo. So I don't have the lens prescriptions, but I would have now moved to making a paraxial lens that captures our, captures our F1 system. And then I would have added a surface immediately after that paraxial lens. And then using those two piece, those two values that we found on our original system, exit pupil diameter is going to be now the entrance pupil diameter. And that the location of the exit pupil is what we're going to update here to the thickness value. The only caveat is multiplying that by minus one. And the reason for that is the 
exit pupil position from prescription data is referenced to the image plane um, in Optic Studio. So the minus one is going to correct for that uh, change in coordinate system there. So now we have our black box equivalent to our optical test system, and we've now properly located the exit pupil with the exit, right, exit pupil size. So now we can go to file and do the conversion of MX data into Optic Studio data. And so if we go to the int Zernike exchange here on the convert file formats group, we can go to browse. And then we can locate the INT file that we had just saved. We can say open. And then we're going to go ahead and do this convert and save now the native .dat file inside of this folder. And it's already in there, so we're just going to say OK. And it's going to show us that our conversion is successful. So we say OK. And now on the surface, immediately after the paraxial lens, we'll go ahead and navigate to the Zernike fringe phase surface type. Once that's updated in our lens data editor, we can go ahead and look at the surface properties and go to import. Once we're in import, we can browse for our file. So I'm navigating back to that folder and I'm gonna find the dot dat that we just created and I'm gonna say okay. And then I'm going to import that INT Zernike file we got from MX onto the surface here. And you'll notice that my wavefront over here doesn't look quite correct, right? We've got this collapse thing here. And you're going to say, what's going on with this? Well, if you scrolled over in the lens data editor, you will go ahead and find a term, which is this normalized radius term. So in our INT Zernike file, we have fit these coefficients to a known size. And what happened here is we basically scaled that normalized radius down to one. So all we need to do is adjust to the correct clear aperture, and in this case, it's a 10 millimeter lens system that we're working with. And so we now apply the Zernike coefficients over the normalized radius appropriately, and then you see the wavefront that we do expect out here. You could also go to the .dat file and update this value as well, such that if you clicked import, the radius would automatically update, or like I said, you can do this through the lens data editor here. So now that we've applied this phase to the exit pupil, Let's go ahead and just jump back to the presentation to look at the quick summary of that. So we had our exit, or excuse me, our exit pupil phase added, and we got our wavefront map out from there. And then we had our uh, measured wavefront here in uh, MX, and you can see that the magnitudes of those OPDs um, match quite quite well. Excuse me. And one thing I'd like to point out is you'll see this color inversion that exists here. In MX, this blue corresponds to a longer OPD, and that happens to be the red in Optic Studio. So this is just a, a coloring of OPD change that exists here. Um, so why would we actually apply this, this first case study? What would we actually do with this here? Well, this might be something like doing a final check of system alignments. So we've put our system together and we said, this is the appropriate alignment places that we have all of our lens set up, and we wanna go and say, what's our ending wavefront? What's that gonna look like for performance? Or we might think of something like a final component contribution to the entire wavefront um, based on the assembly. So if something in our assembly has been measured, what's the contribution of the wavefront error of that whole uh, thing based on a component and or small self-assembly? And then the other thing that we might even think about, let's assume what we've uh, accounted for alignment and fabrication errors, um, but we haven't actually modeled uh, or measured this in a fixture or how we're actually gonna hold the lens elements. Maybe we can introduce some mounting errors to our optical model and take a look to see what the end performance is going to be. So just a couple of um, ideas for how we can actually use this information you know, from this process. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and take a brief pause here for questions from the audience. Yeah, we've got a few good questions here. First one, can you apply this technique during a surface measurement? Uh, yes, and so if we're measuring in reflection, um, we're going to go ahead and get we're going to get a surface measurement. So if we convert that appropriately to uh, a wavefront error, then we can apply the same kind of technique, uh, you know, to that data set. We're actually going to see a version of this in, coming up here. Yeah, and related to the next uh, section, what if you're using a or measuring a square or rectangular part? Since the Zernikes aren't valid, what can you do about that? 
Yep, there's also inside of MX, there are uh, different fit functions that exist. There's a Cartesian fit, um, and then there's also a Legendre's toolbox that exists there. Um, and you can apply uh, these different phase, uh, you know, updates inside of Optic Studio, depending on the, um, you know, type of surface that you've done. We also have the ability to export um, our phase information as a grid. And in this case, uh, it'll be a basically an M by N set of points, which we're going to get into in this next section. And that grid can now also be imported as either phase or change in SAG into Optic Studio. So different, different areas to go and apply this. One more question for now. Sure. Uh, why do you place that error at the exit pupil? So typically, uh, we're going to define the error of the system at the exit pupil. We're going to define all of our aberrations with respect to that. So if we have a system assembly and we want to look at the phase contribution to the wavefront from a single surface or a sub-assembly, we want to apply that phase to the total exiting wavefront, which is going to be at that exit pupil location. So that's why we update the phase there. And that's it for questions for now. All right, great. So we'll go ahead and work into our second case study. And you know, from our question that we had just, just heard from the audience, um, we're going to take a look at a different file conversion type. And so we're going to make a assumption here, and this is mislabeled actually, this is supposed to be an R4 lens system uh, with an index of 1.5, and we're going to be measuring this part in reflection. So this is going to be a surface measurement from this cartoon that we see up here. And we're going to export this as our rectangular um, M by N uh, grid function, which is now representing the surface phase um, over a series of points uh, collected by our interferometer. And then very similarly, we're going to move this back into Optic Studio, convert to the native .dat. But then in this case, we're going to apply this perturbation that we've measured off of our surface directly to uh, the surface under test in Optic Studio. So we want to see what happens when we measure a deviation, apply that deviation to the surface under test or the surface in our model, and then take a look at the wavefront effect of adding this aberration back in. And we'll also take a look at the SAG to kind of show that we're applying this correctly. And so again, we want to track down the kind of steps that we're going to go through here by watching the, the mechanics. We have a starting wavefront based on our uh, nominal lens surface, and it's got some residual wavefront error. We're going to measure a deviation on that surface and try to apply that surface deviation to um, the, the model and then go and say, does this compare well to what we have found and measured inside of um, um, MX to make sure our steps are again correct. So here's our, our ending goal here for this. And so with that, let's go ahead and jump to MX. I'm going to navigate to surface. And I'm going to jump up here to this user tools, and then there's a data generate user tool that's over here. And this is going to pop up on a different portion of my screen. So I'll go ahead and drag this over. Data generate is going to allow me to basically make a surface, right? So we're going to put in a known amount of aberration, which is in this case a few ways of astigmatism and a few ways of spherical aberration. I'm going to define that over a 500 by 500 grid. And I'm also going to give it a lateral resolution and I tell it that the input value is going to be waves then in this case. And so once I've done this, I can simply say generate, and this is going to make for me a 25 millimeter uh, object with, again, a few waves of error imparted into it. And so what we're going to do here is export this now as a grid INT file format. And so I could either right click and do output export data, or very simply at the top with file export data, Selecting my output type as an INT, I can now add a new file in here, which is a rectangular grid INT file, and go ahead and say save. And that already exists. So now again, we have information from MX captured appropriately. So we'll go ahead and navigate to Optic Studio. And then in Optic Studio, we again have another model that's ready to go. We won't save changes here. And so as I had mentioned before, our test case is going to be an R4 lens system, and we'll see this here in a second. So we have a 25 millimeter aperture um, uh, lens surface. It's a radius of 100 millimeters, and then we've got an N1.5 index material. And so now we have our starting wavefront. You can see the starting wavefront error that exists here. And we're going to apply a different order of operations for this. And here we're actually just going to start with the conversion to an Optic Studio.dat. 
So again, to move my MX data into a usable file format, we go to convert file formats and we see this INT grid to opticstudio.dat. We are going to tell the Optic Studio that we need a 25 millimeter surface represented by our INT file. We're going to browse for that file that we had saved from MX. We're going to say open. And then we're going to convert that and where we save this file is actually going to be in a specific location. So we're going to navigate to Documents, ZMAX, and then the Objects folder, and then there's a Grid Files folder. So again, that's Documents, ZMAX, Objects, Grid Files, and we're going to save this .dat in this Grid Files location. And we're going to talk about why we actually do this here in a second. So let me go ahead and just say Save. There's obviously a copy there, and we can see that our conversion is now successful. So once we have that, we now have our surface that we want to perturb. And so we can navigate to the grid sag surface type and apply a grid sag surface. And similar to before, we're going to go down to the surface properties and then we're going to hit export, or excuse me, import. And you'll notice this drop down that's here and you'll see our grid files that live here. So for a grid sag object type in Optic Studio, it wants to look in that folder we navigated to, to find this dot dat to apply to the surface. So we can simply click our surface and select import and say, okay. And now you see that there's an update and a change to the wave front here. So let's go ahead and actually look to see what we've done. So I'm gonna change the surface to a flat by taking the radius to infinity and I'm going to look at the surface sag on that surface we're applying the grid sag. So we only added a few waves of aberration um, from our data generate. And so therefore my surface error should be on the order of microns. So we can check here as a validation to say, yep, I'm indeed applying this small aberrated cap. And instead it's going to live over now our base radius of hundred millimeters. And so now we've measured the surface deviation in our interferometer converted to Optic Studio and we now see the effect on the actual end wavefront from this measured error. So let's go ahead one more time and step back to the presentation. And that's exactly what we're demonstrating here in our summary. We had a starting wavefront that's just built by our R4 lens system. Then we have measured a surface deviation and then applied the surface deviation to our R4 lens. And then we've looked at what is the wavefront error associated with that um, surface error. And that the difference between the two of them is equal to this 3.75 waves. If we look inside of MX where we've measured our surface, if we now want to compare to the wavefront we see in Optic Studio, we can do a simple conversion for the transmitted wavefront error, one minus n times the OPD, OPD being measured the measurement from MX, and we find that that value and magnitude is quite close to um, what we see in Optic Studio. This minus sign that you see here is from the convention again of optical path difference. We could have scaled our data in MX by minus one, and then we would have seen the same color map change and again, seen the proper sign on these two things, but magnitude remaining the same. So in a quick summary of why would we apply this uh, rectangular grid now as opposed to INT Zernike, uh, perhaps now we can introduce something like uh, form and mid spatial error to our model and understand something about the end performance there. Or if we measured a lens assembly and it has several different data maps, we could understand something about the largest contributor to potentially an error budget. And furthermore, we could even think about something like stray light analysis. If we have a deviation of the surface, what happens now with any ghost reflections? Does this affect performance? Again, just a few ideas of how to actually use this information in our optical system. So with that, we'll go ahead and take another brief pause for questions and answers. One more, uh, more of a comment than a question here, but someone pointed out, uh, you may have mentioned, but just to make sure that the principal wavelength in ZMAX is matching to, so maybe just want to point that out, uh, how you would do that. Yep, that's a great question. Let's go ahead and navigate to Optic Studio quickly. So on the left-hand side, there's a system explorer here, and this has our basically setup conditions here um, for the different things, so fields and wavelengths. And the comment is really looking at this wavelength. So what wavelength of light are we performing on the model here? So for a standard Fizeau interferometer from Zygo, we're gonna use the Heaney wavelength 632.8 nanometers. And so that's the wavelength that I'm basing this off here. So if you have a change in the wavelength in Optic Studio, 
and you try to measure like on let's say our Fizeau interferometer, you will see a difference in uh, this reported surface error. So that's a great point, um, a great comment to make sure that we do understand it working at uh, 633. So thank you for that. Another question here. Uh, can you invert the data before you export it from MX? Yes, so that, that's what I mentioned with the, the scaling there when we did the uh, transmitted wavefront error. Uh, there are service processing steps where you can actually scale the data set by minus one uh, before you actually do the export, um, and then that would give you the, the correct orientation then of that um, when you went and did that comparison. So yes, absolutely. Okay, great, that looks like it for now. Okay, so let's continue right along. And this is gonna be a really, really fun example. Uh, I had a lot of fun actually putting this together with some of my colleagues and trying to prove out this concept of, you know, can we build something actually, you know, uh, on a tabletop and then do this process and learn something about an optical system. And so for here, we're gonna kind of switch the flow and we're gonna instead move from Optic Studio, export data that can be brought in and imported to MX, and then also see if uh, we can manipulate some stuff and look at data inside of MX now. Um, so to talk about that real world example, uh, we were brainstorming and we said, well, you know, what's an optical system that's fairly simple to set up and, and simple to measure. So we came up with the idea of doing a beam reducer. Um, and so what you see here is an interferometer off screen with a transmission flat. You see an RF or return flat here in the back, and then you've got this beam reducer set up. So we specified uh, the beam reducer that we wanted to, uh, wanted to make based on a four inch system. We said, you know, can we shop for a local vendor to go and find some lens elements, which we were able to find. And then we had some uh, leftover parts uh, around in our demo lab in Middlefield to actually put this together on a breadboard. And something really cool about this is you'll kind of notice it's actually sitting on the floor of one of my colleagues' houses. Um, and we've got a really great webinar that shows the dynamic capabilities of our interferometer um, that was done uh, a few weeks ago. And in noisy environments, you know, this sitting on a floor and on a kind of a breadboard here, you can still get a really, really nice data map from here. And so our measured data for this is going to be actually taken on this floor. So again, you know, that's a webinar on dynamic interferometry. You can go ahead and check that out. Uh, it's really, really interesting. And that's how we have actually captured this real world case here. So again, let's, let's talk about quickly uh, our workflow of what we're going to do in this, in this steps here. And we're gonna make the assumption that our beam reducer setup in the model is going to match basically what we just saw on that same breadboard layout. Um, and if you, depending on the vendor, you can typically uh, load and find the actual lens data file as specified by the manufacturer and then load that into Optic Studio. So that gives us a nice one-to-one -one as a model there and should give us our idea wavefront. And the steps are going to be, we're going to actually export an INT Zernike file format from Optic Studio. And we're gonna do that via macro. And we're going to bring that INT file that MX can read inside of MX, and we're going to save that out as a DATX file, the native file format for height data in MX. And then we're going to take a look at trying to do understand something about the differences and uncover anything like lens error um, by alignment or fabrication, uh, see if we can't find some of these errors, errors and explore them. And so again, we want to just kind of have this, this focus of what is going to be our end goal through these steps. We're gonna generate this wavefront inside of Optic Studio based on our beam reducer setup. We're gonna navigate and bring this back over to MX and check on the wave or the, the wavefront data that we've measured over there. And then try to perform some of these differences to say how well does our model and our measurement agree with one another. So with that, let's go ahead and switch over to Optic Studio again. And again, we will open up another file that we have already created. And there's gonna be a couple of different things that we navigate through here um, in this data set to, to do this kind of conditioning. And I just wanna walk through those very quickly. Uh, in this lens data editor, you're going to see uh, a bunch of steps that are basically uncovered here and ignored. So right now, this is an afocal image uh, system. So we've got collimated light in, we're expecting collimated light out from our beam reducer. So we make our system afocal. And right now we're seeing the single pass test, right? So light is coming in from left to right and ending over here on the right side. Well, the interferometer is actually going to be measuring this in a double pass configuration. And so if we come here and we uncheck those surfaces, we can set up the double pass system by mirroring our lens elements by putting a mirror over here. So now we represent right, the collimated light in from the TF and the return flat back here uh, from the instrument. And so we've modeled the double pass. And what I wanna point out is this 33.75 value 
it's going to be hard for you to see, but this is saying that the exit pupil diameter is 33.75. And indeed, when we go to MX and we look at our measured data, we're going to see that value based on a lateral calibration inside of our data set. Well, the way that we get there, um, there's actually the system stop is our small lens down here. And in the physical setup, that small lens has a retaining ring, which is used to hold basically into our mount. And that retaining ring is going to block some of the clear aperture then in this case, which is effectively going to reduce the exit pupil diameter. And so to do that appropriately, we reduce the clear aperture on the test lens system such that when we export the um, Zernike coefficients, they represent the wavefront um, as we would expect from this 33.75 millimeter exit pupil. So again, one-to-one -one equivalent on the wavefront check. Right, so I just want to make a couple of those notes before we move into the data from MX. So I mentioned to you that we were going to be using a macro to get this information out into an INT file format. And macros can be found under programming. And under programming, I'm going to go to the edit run where our macro lists are going to live. And I'm just going to do an edit here. And you'll see uh, the small macro that exists is a very, very simple text file. It's given a name. I've created the Zygo INT header format that's up here, and then it's going to populate itself with 37 uh, Zernike terms representing our wavefront, and then we're going to output this to a file here, right? So very, very simple little macro. So if we execute this, it's going to create a text window, and the text window is going to have our file format and header, and it's going to have um, our Zernike information. It's going to ask me to save the window. And now we've got this INT data file saved out appropriately. All right. So with this, we can navigate back to MX now and see if we can't interact with our Optic Studio data inside of MX. So I'm going to now load a new application, not save the previous. For MX, there are specific settings, um, different se uh, sequencings that you can do by analysis, uh, different toolboxes you can turn on. So anything you do can be saved in an application and you can have several applications that simply load with all these settings in place. So if you're doing multiple parts, different test setups, um, looking at different types of surface measurements, this is a really flexible way to not have to recreate the same thing over and over again. Um, it makes a nice port over to um, you know, another package or something like that. So that's an application that we've just loaded there. And so this application is going to have some of my uh, steps already set up. And so what we're going to do is to, just to start by loading the measured beam reducer data that we measured on our uh, interferometer on the floor. And you can see here's that 3.75 millimeter um, aperture. So the first step that we want to do in this demonstration is getting the Optic Studio wavefront we've exported into an MX.DATX file format. So to do that, we can again navigate to user tools and data generate. And inside of Data Generate, I've already pre-populated a few different parameters. The first one's going to be the height of, and width of the camera, and that's coming from our interferometer. The second thing you're going to notice is the center x, y, and then the radius. There is a processing step going on, which is fitting the Zernike terms to the data set we have underneath here. And it's going to tell me this information on where is it fitting the center and where is it fitting um, as in terms of a radius of the Zernike. I can report those results here to a grid or I could do something like navigate to the Zernike's toolbox to find that same information. Uh, but it just shows you that this information does exist in different parts of MX, so we've updated that. I've given it the letter resolution of the input data set from MX uh, that we measured, and I've also told it my input units are going to be waves then. So from here, now we can simply import um, the, the surface that we've actually exported from Optic Studio. We can say open. And now we can say generate that data set and close out from here. So now we have our Optic Studio data set in MX. And it's very simple now. We just go down to a file, save data. I'm going to save it as a DATX file. I'm going to replace the one that we had here. And the last thing I'm going to do just to set this next set up, I'm just going to reload our measured data, right? Because what we're going to be doing is making a subtraction. We're going to go through these steps here. So we want to subtract the idealized wavefront from our measured data then in this case. So let's go to surface processing. And this is where you can perform different advanced analyses on the data sets um, as you captured them. In this setup, I can add any steps I want by um, saving, or excuse me, right-clicking and then adding a step 
You can also click and drag to sequentially order these things. So as they show up in the list, they're going to be processed in that order. And this is a new function for MX 8.0 that we just released. If you're on MX 7.7 and earlier, this is going to be a different tool under user tools called Data Manipulate. Um, but you can still perform the same process even if you're not on M MX 8.0. But this 8.0 makes this very convenient and very easy now uh, to do these different service processing steps. So I highly recommend uh, going for that upgrade. So in the subtract function, this is our first step that we're going to do here. So I'm going to check this toolbox on, and then I'm going to navigate to try to find that DATX file we just made from our Optic Studio import. And I'm going to load that file into here. And so we spent a lot of time lining up our data sets. So we get the correct subtraction over top of one another. And now I'm, I'm subtracting the measured data and I'm subtracting out this idealized wave front. We're going to add an auto aperture, which is going to clip the 98% uh, of the outer aperture over here. I'm removing form. And in this case, I'm removing tilt, coma, and astigmatism. And we'll talk about that in a second here. And then I'm going to apply a spike clip to just get rid of spurious pixels in this data set here. And I'm going to go ahead and exit out. And so now we're looking at all of those sequencing, uh, those processing steps applied to these two data sets. So we're now we're looking at the difference between um, the uh, Optic Studio and MX of our measured data set of the beam reducer. And so I removed all of these terms because we want to assume that those terms are either due to fabrication or alignment, but it shows a really nice agreement here across this aperture, um, you know, very, very low RMS value. So this subtraction is, is quite strong. So now if you want to ask yourself the question, well, what happens if I want to learn something about my actual test and measured data? Can I learn something about fabrication error? Can I learn something about alignment? Let's make the assumption that everything due to alignment is going to be boiled down to tilt and coma, right? Those aren't in the part. Those are due to misalignments of my test setup. So I can remove astigmatism and reanalyze my data set. And I've said, get rid of all alignment errors and that everything left might be attributed to mechanical and or fabrication error. With this, we could take our data set back out and go to uh, a post-polishing -pro post -pol process, excuse me, uh, or something along those lines to now re recut our lens surface or improve our lens surface uh, residual form error. If you then wanted to take another step and say, well, I've created a alignment um, routine and I want to see how well does that alignment routine uh, apply to basically a system assembly. You can pull out your fabrication terms or you know other terms that exist here for mechanical and then say, what does the residual alignment look like then in this case? And I can say, well, I can definitely do better on tilt, so let me just add that back in. And you can even see in our interferogram here, we have some residual coma left over um, from the alignment. This gives you some ability to now play with how well is my alignment done, how well is my procedure done. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Really gives you some flexibility here in understanding something about the lens surface. And so with that, we're going to jump back to the presentation. And again, I just want to show you this quick summary that we successfully found and made our, our um, uh, idealized wavefront in Optic Studio. We exported that to an INT file and then loaded that into MX. We took the subtraction between the idealized wavefront by removing our potential um, align, or excuse me, lens errors. And then we find a really good agreement between those data sets. And then similarly, we can remove what we think is due to lens error and actually investigate those different um, error components inside of MX uh, by just changing the processes and looking at different fit removes and then a whole other host of things that you can actually do. So with this, we've kind of gone very quickly through a couple of easy steps to get you information between your metrology setup, which is now MX, and then you uh, your optical modeling package, which is going to be, in this case, Optic Studio. And we show that there's really good agreement between uh, both model and measurement and that we actually were able to capture on a real world setup something about fabrication and alignment error uh, during our, our actual um, metrology test. And we did that through these really simple to use file formats, these two INT file formats and then our dat, uh, .dat x file format uh, really gives a lot of power and flexibility to this stuff. And now MX also has many other file formats that can be exported to different packages. And with that, you can learn new pieces of information about your optical system, whether it's in the beginning or towards the end there. So it's a really good demonstration of that. Now with that, I'd like to open up just for questions on um, that last section there, or just questions overall from the audience. Yeah, good question here. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about how to attribute errors to alignment versus fabrication or polishing? Sure. Um, so with alignment errors, uh, they typically end up being things um, right that are non-symmetric. Then in this case, so you know, coma shows up as a as an asymmetry, um, right? So you got a high and a low lobe. Then in that case, well, if you look at a standard um, you know, way to, you know, glass fabricate, right? So polishing, right? Polishing is not gonna usually introduce any of those, um, you know, type of, you know, um, asymmetric errors. And so you can commonly or confidently say, that's usually going to be an error induced by now decentering of lenses then, uh, which is what we saw in this case. So there's some information, if you understand how your lenses were actually made, that you can start to attribute whether this is coming from alignment and or coming from polishing uh, based on those. Next question here. Um, is that export macro that you used in Optic Studio available? So it's it's not stock to Optic Studio, but that's uh, definitely something you could contact us and we can you know deploy to you if that's something of interest uh, or something you might want to use for your system, um, or we can even just show you how to create that. It's a very very simple little macro, but it's not native, so you know go ahead and contact us and we can we can help you out with that. Okay, just seeing if any more questions are coming in. Sure. Um, yeah, how do you ensure that your MX measured data and then the ZMAX data are correctly oriented with one another? So this, how, how do you make sure they're aligned? Yep. Uh, so if you have um, basically asymmetries uh, between the data sets, one way that I find is really easy to do is, you know, so if you've got, um, your Optic Studio data, and then you've got this MX data set. What you can do is if you're gonna go apply a subtraction to that, you can go bring in the data sets and then say, okay, I can rotate or provide a rotate function to the input data set, and then find basically where that's minimum such that those two things are going to agree um, or line those things up. If you're doing it from the opposite end, right, you can also clock the part, right, inside of your mount when you're doing your testing. So there's a few different ways to line up those different um, you know, data sets. Now, if you're talking about uh, applying these to different surfaces, sometimes that's just a change of the scaling, whether it's minus one or plus one on how you render the data set. Um, it's really how you intend to measure versus how you intend to incorporate it into your model then. But those are just a few examples of how you might you know, reconcile that. Okay, I think we have time for one more here. Um, can you show how MX reports the quality of the Zernike fit? So got yeah. looking at that residual error. Sure. We will jump in here to MX. And if you pass processing to the toolbox, um, we're going to go ahead and see, you know, basically the process data inside of the Zernike's toolbox. So I'm just going to pull off those two fit terms there. And I'm going to turn the Zernike toolbox on. I'll let it go up to the 12th order fit. Oops, if I actually click it. And we report basically, here's our residual map up here at the top. And then you can see the residual RMS is a function of the Zernike order down here. So the Zernike's toolbox gives you a lot of this uh, powerful information here um, to actually understand something about the residual fit. Okay, perfect. So I think that looks like it for now. All right, just jump back really quick. So if there was anything that we didn't cover here or we didn't get a question answered um, in the chat, we have all the questions logged. We'll definitely follow up with you, you know, offline. Like I said, there's a copy of the handout that you can um, you know, download from uh, GoToWebinar right now. And also, this will be pro uh, the webinar will be posted on our, our YouTube channel, so you can always review it later. And if you have any questions uh, for the applications team or someone else at Zygo, you can always go to inquire at zygo.com or zygo.com slash contact. And we're happy to take uh, any questions related to this stuff or even help you out if, if you have a model um, that you'd like us to take a look at. So I would you know, just want to thank everyone for taking some time, whether it's in your afternoon or your morning, to come and sit with us. Um, and we'll catch you again on the next webinar. Thank you, everyone.